article of Time magazine. And for today, we read a, a couple of sociologists that say secularization theory is completely wrong. And by the end of this lecture, I'll review their argument and then tell you a position I take somewhere in the middle. So today is February 19th, 2009. Just a quick overview. I'm going to say a few words about preparing for the test. Then we're going to cover the topic of secularization no, where we talk about the argument from Finke and Stark, which you read for today. Then we'll talk about secularization maybe, which is kind of my middle ground position. And then finally, uh, I'll do a quick kind of overview of the themes that we've covered in the course so far to help you orient a little bit for your uh, midterm exam studying. Um, before we get started then, let me remind you that if you have any questions for midterm exam, it's best not to wait till Monday, the day before the exam. I know that's probably when you'll do a lot of your studying, but for the purposes of me being able to reply to you and to the whole class about questions, I will take questions up until about noon on Sunday before I compose a review lecture. If I don't get any questions, I won't compose a review lecture. Um, but so if you have any questions, however minute they may be, fire them my way. I'll try to answer them. Anything after Sunday, I have no guarantee that I'll be able to get to, but if there are questions sent to me, what I'll likely do is post them in the FAQ section of D D2L. That way any question that, that gets asked, I can try and type a reply to everyone so everyone benefits. So let's leap right in um, to this article we, we read for today. Um, the author's last names are Finke and Stark, and they're actually a rather well-known uh, duo within the sociology of religion. And let me start off by saying they tend to try and write provocative pieces, okay? So if you made it through the whole article, you, you saw they had all sorts of asides and historical examples and quotations where they really try and kind of marshal evidence uh, for their argument against the idea of religion. And uh, let me tell you, um, let me kind of outline what some of the main things are. So they, they basically had kind of five arguments um, against secularization. One is what they call the myth of religious decline. The next is myth of past piety. Um, the failure to Christianize, which is kind of a unique argument um, that's mostly unique to the two of them. I'll try and make sense of that. Um, subjective religiousness is, a, is another reason. And finally, they, they say a number of things about religion and science. You should note that right from the beginning, the uh, title of this article is Secularization R.I.P. So Secularization Rest in Peace. That was an overt uh, play on words, if you will, um, because secularization theory, as we reviewed on Tuesday, was that religion would die. So secularization uh, uh, theorists might write an article that said, religion, rest in peace. And these guys, in trying to respond and saying, no, you're wrong, are writing an argument that says secularization theory, you rest in peace. Um, so they're, they're, they're polemical in a way in what they're trying to say. And what you notice too in reading is that uh, Rodney Stark, who's one of the co-authors, he's been writing since about the 1950s, 1960s. And he quotes himself at length in this article to say, look, there have been a few voices, i.e. myself, throughout this whole decades long argument about secularization who have been saying that no secularization theory is wrong. So let me go quickly through their arguments. The first, the myth of religious decline, they're basically saying there's no there's no uh, documented long-term pattern of uh, religious decline. What they mean by this is they look at really a few kind of crucial statistics, if you will, um, of individuals. So in this article, they're actually mixing their levels of analysis. I'll say a little bit bit about that in terms of my summary of secularization theory. But for this argument, they're kind of looking at individuals and they're saying, you know what? At least in the United States since the Revolutionary War, church attendance may have actually increased since the, the Revolutionary War. So instead of secularization theorists who say, oh, religion has declined, they're saying, well, according to this one statistic, uh, we think it may have actually increased. And then they also say that church membership has increased in the United States since the Revolutionary War. 
Uh, these are technical arguments that we could go a lot more into, uh, but they're right in some ways, or at least I would say in interpreting this first argument, that they're right that there has been some fluctuations in individual religious participation in the United States, but for the most part there's no kind of grand uh, religious decline um, that's occurring. Then they have this interesting argument where they say, uh, they call it the myth of past piety. If you think for a second that example I've used occasionally of kind of medieval uh, stone churches and Catholicism being the union of both church and state in Europe, they're saying that if we look um, to that time period, instead of it being the golden age of religiousness, they're saying in reality, most individuals that lived during that time really didn't participate much in religion. Sure, you had this strong connection between church and state, and you had churches dotting every small town in Europe, but if you actually look at um, the rate of normal people, shopkeepers, uh, serfs, um, uh, members of the military, actually in, partici uh, in participating in religion at that time, they're saying that most of the historical evidence is that they didn't tend to uh, uh, participate in the official religion of the day. And not only that, but they, they um, may be similar to us moderns, had all sorts of a range of beliefs that they incorporated in their spirituality. So they may, may have had like folk wisdom and folk stories that had been passed down for centuries. They might have mixed some sort of a naturalistic element. They might have also borrowed from other religious traditions that they might have countered. For example, uh, Jewish and Islamic peoples in Spain, that's something that might have filtered into the actual practices of people. So uh, Pinky and Stark arguing, they're making this kind of uh, double-edged argument with these first two arguments. The first are saying, well, th there has been no decline um, so there's been no kind of downward curve that comes down, but they're saying there also was never that high of religious partition way in the past. So if you bring down the past relative to the present, then any decline that would have occurred would have been much less of a decline. But then they also say, well, there wasn't much decline to, to have to, to begin with. So they're kind of have this double barreled argument uh, in terms of historical rates of change in individual religious participation. And then they switch to kind of another level of analysis, this argument called failure to Christianize. And this is kind of interesting. It's more of a social or um, institutional organizational argument. And what they say was um, in this past kind of golden age, because, and the example they use is Christianity, because Christianity was the one state church in Europe, particularly before the Protestant Reformation, they consider the religion of that time lazy. In other words, what they're, they're using an economic argument. They're saying Christianity had a monopoly. And using economic logic, they're saying in any monopoly, there's kind of laziness to be able, in terms of developing a good product that people will want to buy. So to extend it to religion, they're saying religion in a monopoly is not a product that's really attuned to the needs of individuals. It doesn't have to be because it's a monopoly. And therefore individuals are much, much less likely to take it seriously and to participate. And that they're arguing that, that, that this was the case. And so when people talk about, oh, but all of Europe was Christian at one point way back when, they're saying a lot of that was just political affiliation. So a king, or uh, the local prince might become uh, one strand of Christian religion, and then the whole kingdom was quote unquote that religion. But what they're saying is that for the most part, these are just kind of political alliances and they don't really tell us anything uh, about the depth of religiousness uh, among a people. Um, finally, they, they have this, or not finally, but then their first, fourth point is, is they say, well, if you actually look at the subjective dimension of religion. So kind of belief in God, belief in the afterlife, belief that God is present in the world, that sort of thing. They claim that there's been very little, if any, decline in, in the subjective dimension of religious belief. So they say, yes, sociologists often talk about Europe having uh, lower rates of uh, religious participation. Uh, and not many people go to church and the churches are empty, but they say, well, you know, there's reasons for that. Uh, Europe was never fully Christianized, so we can't really say that anything's fallen apart if it was never really thickly Christianized. It was this lazy monopoly. And not only that, they say, people still seem to report these subjective measures of religiousness. And then finally, and this is where they, at some level, really kind of um, take their hacks 
at, uh, at sociologists that support the secularization theory. They say there is no conflict between religious and religion and science, and they marshal all sorts of arguments. They say, 